Open your mouths. Two, Acts. You can go to Acts 11 and then just hang out in there. Um, but I want to talk about, uh, anyone ever been to New York City? Yeah. Right? And so when I was a kid, we used to go down to this place called, um, I think it's Battery Park. And I remember going to Battery Park, and it's, like, it's where you get on the boat to go over to the Statue of Liberty. And as we're, my brother and I, and my, I don't even I think my mom and my stepdad, we were walking through, this guy comes out with this case. And he whips it open, and there's a bunch of nice watches. He's like, I got a Rolex, I got this, I got that. And I'm like, how much is it? And they're like, 15 bucks. I give you two for 20. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Last time I checked, the Rolex is like four, five, six, seven, eight hundred, maybe a thousand. How much Rolex? Anyone know? I don't even know. It was a lot of money. It's, it's not two for 20, I'll tell you that. You know? And it's, it's interesting because when we look at, you know, these, these, these types of items, um, it's, like, it's, it's super exciting because you're like, wow, I can get something really nice for nothing. And then I remember specifically um, we were down in, in Chinatown and the coach bags were like super like uh, exciting and whatnot. And I'm looking, I'm like, these coach bags. And I'm like, we were just on Fifth Avenue after we took from the subway. And, and these coach bags over there were like, like I kid you not, like 1500 bucks, $2,000. I'm like, how can a piece of fabric be that much money? That's a different story anyways. But we went down to Chinatown, and in Chinatown, same bag, I kid you not, right? Looks exactly the same thing, 10 bucks. I'm like, how does a coach bag go from $2,000, same thing, that I started to look at it, and it's like the C wasn't really a C. It was like more close. It was more like an Osh bag, but it would still look the same. It's just a little different. And, and the funny thing is, is like, is, is we, would, we would call that more of like a, it, we call it a knockoff, right? Yep. These are knockoff items. Or I remember when I was in Iraq, you'd be driving down the road and there's a little booth, like a table, whatever thing was. But this kid had hundreds of CDs. And I'm like, CDs? What are those things? And we go, they were DVDs. I'm like, oh, cool. He's like, these are still in the theaters. Haven't even come out on DVD. I'm like, well, you got them right there. How'd you get that? He goes, it doesn't matter. He, a dollar. I give you five for a dollar, actually. And so I'm like, oh, sure, no problem. I pay, give, him, give him a dollar, I get five, five DVDs, go back, we'd watch them. And I'm like, wow, this is awesome. You can see it until, guess what? Until someone's head pops up and walks across the screen. Yes. Yeah. And I'm like, you would call that bootleg, yep. right? And, you know, it's the same thing that I remember, um, I remember also going in New York. And New York is great because you can get a whole lot of bootleg and knockoff stuff that looks like the real thing. And I remember going into a Disney store, and we were, we were looking at stuff, and I, we were a cheap family. And so um, we, <laughs> there's these like, T-shirts, like 30, 40, 50 bucks. And you can get the same thing right outside the store for two for five. I'm like, what am I going to pay 40, 50 bucks for when I can go outside and it's only, it's only like two bucks, I mean, whatever, five bucks. So naturally, we went outside and bought the cheap ones. But the interesting thing is that, that extra large shirt, that, that it, when I put it on and I'm like, this thing's great. And it can be like screenshot and like, just, it's just like, man, this thing's awesome. And you're walking around with it and you take it home, you put it in the wash and that extra large just turned to an extra small and it's now see-through. And you're like, you're like, what is this? Maybe I should have bought the $40 one. But you, you see that the same thing happened to, to two men um, in the, the story of, he says, when, when they built their house on what? One built, these two wise men built their house on the rock, and the other one built his house on sand. We all know that parable, we all know the story, but the interesting thing that happens, they both, prior to the, the end of the story occurring, they both look the same. They both built a house. You just can't, I wish Christian was here, he builds foundations. You just can't see the foundation. And so the interesting thing is, what is it that reveals which one is the true, solid, genuine house? What happens? A storm, water, a huge washing machine comes and takes that extra large and shrinks it down to an extra small and says, this is not the real thing. And one house gets washed away because it's on sand. The other is on a rock. And I've been thinking a whole lot about just, you know, we live in a society where 73, if, uh, give or take, of our population claims itself to be Christian. But the reality is that our, our policies and things within our country are degrading so rapidly, and it's not really Christian-like. And so 
The question is, if 73% if of our population and a vast majority of people are so quote-unquote Christian, then why is, are so many in such a state of disrepair? For example, um, I, one of my friends, uh, Willie at Metro Ministries, um, he wrote a post on Facebook uh, yesterday, and he said, hey, I went to one of my sites today. You know, they do the sites in Brooklyn or whatever and a bunch of different places. And he said, as I got to my site, I saw, some, I saw three kids in the garbage can digging through garbage. And um, I, I didn't know if I knew him or not, but hey, you know, Willie knows a lot of people. He, he grew up there and he's been doing ministry forever. And he walked over to them and he, he knew them. They were kids from, from Metro, that, that one, some of their kids. And, and so they walked over and he says, hey, he goes, what are you guys doing? He goes, and he turned around and he goes, hey, Willie, what's going on? And uh, he goes, you know, I'm really sorry. They were like, like 9, 10, 11 years old. He's like, you know, hey, I know this looks really weird, but, um, you know, we don't, our mom, dad, they, they didn't give us any food. And we got to do this to find food. And we, we pull tra uh, cans and bottles out of here so we can go return them and, and, get, and get to buy, buy a meal tonight. And we do this every day. And Willie, fighting back the tears, says, hey, I, I got it. I totally understand. And pulls the money out. Hey, you know what? Have a meal on me tonight. Go, 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 get, a piece. go get a slice of pizza or something. So they go do that. And then he starts going back and he, and he finishes his post off saying, you know, and to look at this, I will go home tonight. I'll lay in a bed. I'll go home to a, fi a fridge full of, full of food. And I will take a shower, a nice hot shower. I'll get clean with clean clothes. And then I'll lay down on my bed and I will still find something to complain about. And it, it was, it was, you know, it was an, an eye-opener because the thought of this whole Christian concept, if you will, it, it, it really is, is, is what is genuine? What, what, is the real, what, is a real, what is a real Christian? Because we've all been in some sort of situation where we've seen hypocrisy or we've seen certain things that just, we're just like, that's not really what I see in Scripture, guys. I mean, it's like, and I've seen it time and time again. I've been to, growing up with, with, uh, with my dad and my brother, I could, I, we went to hundreds and hundreds of churches because we loved music, and so we chased Christian music. And if the preaching was good, well, so be it. But we love music. And so we would hop and hop, and we'd find some really awesome churches and some, some churches that were just like, I'm never coming back here again. And, and you know, and there was hypocrisy, and, and just this strange, like, I, I don't, I, I, this doesn't make sense to me. Why, why are you doing this? Why are you saying this? Because you're, you're saying you're a Christian. And I, you know, I remember one thing, and I've shared this before, but my dad always said, um, he goes, he said, Jeff, I want to tell you something. He says, don't believe anything anyone ever says. I don't care if they're a pastor. If they preach it, don't ever believe it until you take it to the word and test it to be true. And that has always stuck with me. And he said, and, and, and he, you know, he used to usher for Billy Graham, and he's like, I don't care if Billy Graham tells you. Go, go, go take it to the word and test it to be true. When it's true, then believe him. And so I, that was, that's always been my thought. And so when I look at people... I don't often say it because I don't want to make people feel weird and uncomfortable, and I'm, I'm no different. But the question is, it's like, why do we do things and say things? It's just like, it's so like, it's so unchristian. It's not even, it's not even Christ-like. And so I started thinking about this. I'm like, where, where in the Bible does it talk about Christianity? What, what is this, this, this label Christian? And, and, and what, what shows this authenticity of what a real Christian really is? And it's, it's interesting because we look at um, this, the Bible and do you realize that the Bible only uses the word Christian three times? Three times. It was, is the Christian, that word Christian, it's used very sparingly. And, and the question is like, okay, well, why does it talk about that in, in, in that context? And so as we, as we walk through here, if you want to grab a pen and, and write in your Bible, if you don't write in your Bible, well, write it in your iPhone, do whatever, write it in I something, but write it down. Okay, because I want you to grasp this, and I want you to be able to refer back to this as as um as a way of of testing yourself, because God's word is true, is it not? And so I should be able to, if if I have a question about my my relationship and what is authentic, I should be able to go to the Word of God, open it up, and God should reveal His heart to me and say, Hey, this is right, Jeff. Do this, or Hey, this is wrong. Don't do this. And then I should be able to look at it and be like, Okay, cool. Let's do that. Right? According to the guidance of the Holy Spirit and as He moves me. And so, as we start walking through this, um, I, I want to I pull out three things, if you will, and just, I just really want to hammer on these and say, you know, what is this true Christianity and what is it? So turn to Acts 11, 
26. And we're going to start there for a minute. Acts 11. Right after John. Acts 11. And as we walk through this, um, I, wanna, I just want to pull some things out. Acts 11, 26. So what does a real Christian look like? What, what is it that makes this, 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 real, this Christianity real? And, 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 and it's really, we see it when it comes out in the wash, when, when, when everything changes and, and, and the storm comes, you begin to see the reality. Anyone ever been in a situation where you're like, you're, you're with a Christian and, and they, um, you get in this situation and they're like, they're, everything's like, you're, you're talking normal, you're talking, oh, I'm blessed with this and this is great. And then all of a sudden the person stubs their toe or hits their hand. Yeah. All of a sudden the wash machine turned on and they're like, broop, broop. And it's like the, 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 the true heart nature comes out. And like, oh, sorry about that one. But, it, but it's like, it, it could be anything. It's not just swearing. It's, it's really anything. It's like the, when, when someone gets stressed and all of a sudden everything falls apart and they, and they run to something else that's not of the Lord, well, the, the wash machine got turned on and that extra large is going to an extra small and it's becoming see-through. And you can now use it as nylons if you're a female. So there we go. But we look at Acts 11, and check it out. It says this. A, write this down. A Christian is, it should be a reminder. This is what it says in Acts 11, 26. He says this. And when he found him, he brought him. Now, this is, the, this is talking about Paul. Um, he says, then he went to Tarsus and searched for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year, they met with the church and taught large numbers and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. That is the first place that they are called Christians. Why? Because the disciples, a Christian should be a reminder of Jesus Christ. It should be a reminder of the gospel. And it should be this, this word, this word Christian, that when, when hey, you say, hey, I'm a Christian, or when someone knows that you're a Christian, your life should be a reminder of who Jesus Christ is. Is because if you understand what this word Christian meant, it was a derogatory term that essentially said, Oh, that's Christ's follower, the one we just killed. And so, if you had the label Christian, it wasn't like, I'm a Christian, we got to make woohoo, yeah, we're all Christian, kum this is great, kumbaya. No, it was, You are the one we hate, you are a representation of the very one that we just crucified. So much so that it wasn't this, this group of people that said, hey, we need a mascot, we need to, we need to associate ourselves with something. So we're like, hmm, the rocks, uh, the buffaloes, the bison, the no. You know what? Fish. That'll, we'll be associated with fish. You ever think of, you ever wonder how we even got associated with fish? Right? You put a fish on the back of your car, it's a symbol of I'm a Christian. Yeah. Yes or no? Yeah. I haven't gotten to that point because I'm in fear that, that people are going to see my driving. And they're going to get a bad name about Christianity, so I don't put a fish on the back of my car. But that's a separate conversation. But when we look at this, this conversation about fish, do you understand? I started doing some research on this, the reading. And this was a conversation that, for example, if I didn't know Terry, and I saw him on the road, and I wanted to converse with him and figure out, hey, is this a brother in Christ? Is this just another, another person? We'd be talking. And as we're talking, like, hey, yeah, I saw you power wash this building the other day, and hey, this was great. And while I'm talking, I would take my foot, and I would make a half crescent moon, and I would just step back. I feel like we're, like, selling something on the street for a second, right? I'm just, whoo, or I'm just going to make a half crescent moon. I'm going to step back, keep on talking. Nice shoes. It's really awesome. And he would notice this. And if he was a Christian, he would then say, oh, yeah, I, I certainly was power washing this thing. And, uh, and while I was power washing, he would go and finish that half crescent moon the other way and create a fish. And at that point in time, you'd be like, you're a brother in Christ. And it would open up the door to then have this, be have this relationship to begin without fear of any persecution because now I'm like, I don't want to just throw this out there because there may be a fear of who I really am. And so what this was, it was a reminder this of, of, of who Jesus Christ is. And, and when we begin to look at, at this, this sister and brother and this conversation, and, and the, we, the, our lives, 
do you understand that, that you, if you are a Christian at this time, you could be killed for your faith? I mean, let's get, the world's getting to that point again, right? But the reality is that the, the crucifixions didn't stop at Jesus Christ. They continued for another three centuries or so. And so the, these Christians would continue to get crucified. And so there was a secrecy, if you will, that, that they said, hey, listen, I, I don't want to be caught out, but I still want to serve the Lord and minister. So how do we do this? And that's how they started doing all this stuff. And, and it's interesting, um, you know, as, as Christians, we, we, look at, uh, we look at movies and we're always discerning movies. And a, a guy movie is like, guy movie, I, I, like, I like action movies and um, making sure I watch the right thing. But one, one thing, one movie that's always stuck out to me was, uh, anyone seen the movie Gladiator? Yeah. And I was intrigued by this because I love history. And, um, and, you know, it's that whole time frame of, of the Roman Colosseum, Christians, and all this stuff. Just, um, it, it's intriguing because I'm just like, how can that... How did that happen? You know, and I mean, this is in Paul's day, I mean, all this stuff like that, right? Well, there's one scene, if you, look, if you go through the deleted scenes on here, there's one scene um, that uh, uh, whoever that actor is, um, Russell, Crowe. Ro Russell Crowe, thank you. He's, he's behind this concrete lattice, right? And so as he's looking through this lattice, um, he, he looks out into the center of the Colosseum and he sees a Christian family a, a father, a mother, and, a, and like, th like three or four kids, and they're standing in the center of this Roman Colosseum, and there's a lion that comes out, and it's pacing back and forth, back and forth, and then it puts its paw on the father, and its mouth opens up, and then the scene just cuts. And so they, there, was, there was some articles where, where they asked the producer, Ridley Scott, they said, hey, why, didn't you, why did you take that scene out? Why, why didn't you put that scene in the movie? And he said, well, I, the reason why is because I, I could not accurately depict the suffering Christians actually went through with that scene. And there wasn't a scene that I could create to accurately depict the reality of what Christians went through at that time. And so what happened is he just like, hey, I'm just taking it out. But, the, but the, the interesting thing about this is like, is it is so much more like the, the, these lions, they would, they would be fed. They were, they were left hungry. And then they would, they would take the Christians, they'd put them out in the center of this, this uh, Colosseum, if you will, and the lions would come out and they would eat them so they were fed so that when the gladiators come out, that they wouldn't attack the gladiators as, as greatly as they would attack the Christians because they weren't well fed. And see, th what it meant to be a Christian was that you're going to die. There is a high probability that you're going to die prior to your body giving out because you claim the name of Christ. That word Christianos literally means little Christ. It, it, what it's saying is that you are a representation. You represent the very thing that the Romans hate is this one Jesus Christ, this one God that we worship, Jesus. We hate that and because you represent that, we don't like you either. And so our, this word Christian should be a representation of Jesus Christ. And, and it, what, what we see is that, that, has anyone ever read this book, um, Fox's Book of Martyrs? Jason, you still have my copy? I read it. Before. All right, sounds good. But so in the Fox's Book of Martyrs, it's a whole bunch of stories of, um, anyone ever read it? Come on, you got to read this. I'll, I'll, I'll get a couple copies. We'll push it out because it's awesome. And what it is, it's, it's, it's stories and representations of, of, uh, of real people that were persecuted for their faith. But it's interesting to read because it, I like real life stories. I, I love real life stories because I see where people failed and see where people excelled. And so I can look at them and be like, all right, well, cool. They, they, they obeyed God and, well, I'm going to obey God too because I see the outcome and God represents and shows this. But in this persecution, it also shows that... that when we, when, we, when we are a representation of God, God gives strength and power. Does he not? That when we are weak and broken, God will stand you up and will you, the words will come out of your mouth from the Holy Spirit that are not of humankind. And they will speak into the depth of a heart and change you. That is the Holy Spirit. That is the words of the Holy Spirit and not the words of man. And, I, and, and in, in, the, in the first book, of this Fox's Book of Martyrs. So we, we have the edited edition, but the original, the first edition of the Fox's Book of Martyrs, in the first few pages, it talks about um, these miracles 
and, and, what, and how these miracles in these persecutions occurred. One of which, this girl was 18 years old. Check this out. The girl was 18 years old preaching. And because she was preaching, they took her. And not only did they put her to the lion, but instead of the lion, they put her in the middle of the Colosseum and they, they burned her at the stake. Okay? Get this one. The, 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 it literally says, it says that as they were burning her at the stake, it says that, they, that, she, that God raised her up and she began to preach when the fire went out. Now, I don't know about you, but you don't need an altar call at that point. I'd be like, whoever's God that is, I'm following that one. Right? And so the Roman Colosseum and the Romans, or Nero, whoever they were, they took her and put her back on the stake again, burned her a second time. And it says God raised her up, and she began to preach when that fire went out. That is awesome. Because it's like, you know, I look at that, I'm just like, take that one, devil. You think you can play games with my people? God's like, no, I'll show that. I'll, I, will, I, will, I will put my people center stage. Whether you're on fire for the Lord or fire physically, I'll put you center stage and you will preach the gospel. And thousands will hear. If that's not a divine appointment from the Lord, I don't know what is. But this is a real Christian one who is a representation of Jesus Christ. What are you representing? What are you representing? Do we rep what, what is it? And the, the, the right, let me give you a, another illustration. So, whoever, uh, what, Jason, remember, remember going to the, uh, to the Tacoma Mall? And what would we always go to with, with Dad to go get, or Glenda? We would buy... Orange Julius, or the other place was Mrs. Fields. Oh, yes. Thank you. Yep. Mrs. Fields, I'm glad you're part of my story here. So, <laughs> Mrs. Fields, everyone ever go to Mrs. Fields? Oh, yeah. All right, Mrs. Fields. Cookies are super expensive, but they're super good. But it's interesting because they pull you in because you can get like three, four, five, but if you get five, you get the six one free, yeah. right? And so, this whole thought process is like, I'm going to go there and I'm going to pay an arm and a leg, but if it's, it's good because I got, I got six cookies. Well, Miss, they're, they're so good. Mrs. Fields, the way she got started was she would take a tray and she would go door in Chicago. She'd go door to door to door and give a sample. And she would hand these out and people would take a bite and be like, hmm, that's good. Where can I get more? Where can I get the real thing? Want, I don't want a sample. You ever want to go to BJ's? And that's my favorite thing, the Bethco shop. And I'll just, I'm like, I remember we go to Costco or whatever. And we go, I, Jason and I just go from sample to sample. I'm having dinner tonight at Costco for free. <laughs> but the reality is that, that Jesus, this, this word Christian, this is what it is. We are samples of the real thing. We ought to be a reminder of where they need to go. We don't need to be a reminder of like, hey, come to me because I've got... No, we don't have the answers. Jesus Christ has the answer. And so we are a representation. We are a sample for the very one who is going to give you life, who's going to change you, and who is going to be... It's going to put you on fire for God. It's, it's not just a... It's not a game, folks. It's, I mean, it's, it's not just like this, like... We're, I mean, we live in America. There's, free, there's freedom, and I got it. But the reality is there's, there is a lost world who needs a real representation, a real sample. Let me ask you this. If you bought a Mrs. Fields cookie, and then you went and bought the thing, and you took it home, and it said, Oda Spunkmeyer, you'd be like, I got duped. But do you understand that when the real gospel is not preached in a church or by a person, and you go home and you feel empty, because you haven't gotten anything from that person or through Jesus Christ going to that person because it's, a, it's hypocrisy. You feel duped and empty and then you're like, I'm gypped. And then we're like, oh, all churches are bad. No. Because the real thing will make you want to buy more. And you will go back every time you go to the mall, you'll be like, where's Jesus Christ? Where's, where's Mrs. Field? But no, there's a reality. Like, I want the real thing. And they will create a hunger in you to say, I want the truth. I don't want this fake stuff. I want, I want to be real. I cannot stand talking. It, it frustrates me. I, I love it. I love people. Don't get me wrong. I didn't choose my words correctly. It frustrates me.
talking to people that are not real. Because I'm like, that's a waste of time. <laughs> the way, I won't tell the story. <laughs> but it, it, it's just like, I, I just, come let's, can we just be real? Can we? And I, I always didn't used to be this way. Beth would have, she'd be like, can we just be real? I'm like, I'm fine. Yeah. I didn't even know there was problems with me. But she's like, listen, God wants to work these things out in you. I'm like, work what? I'm perfect. And she'd be like, uh, no. <laughs> but it was awesome because the real thing came to something that was semi-fake and tried to cover things up with a mask and the real hurt that was inside me and said, hey, no, that's not the truth, Jeff. And my life began to change because I began to see the real thing. And I've told this story before, I won't tell the whole thing, but do you understand the only reason that I understood the power and the love of God, of what he really was, was because the real sample stood by me when she should have left me. That's it. And I began to see her in love for Christ, loving me as a sample. She wasn't the answer. Christ was the answer. But because she reflected who Christ was, it drew me to Jesus, and I began to, to understand that he was real. I knew it all along in church. I had always been there. I had gone to time and time again. Sunday school. I've told this story too many times. But you get the point. It's like, it's like let the real, get the real thing. You know? And we look at this thing. It's just like we ought to be a reminder of Jesus. A reminder of Jesus. A sample. You're only a sample. So do not lead people to yourself. Lead them to Christ. And when they grasp a sample of you, you hand them over and be like, here you go, Jesus. I'll lead them to you every day. We're not building an empire here. We're not doing anything. We are leading people to Christ. The word says, if Christ be lifted up, I will draw all men and women to him. We lift Christ up. Number two, here we go. Acts 26, 28. Turn there, please. Going to go right. You'll never have a problem with like alphabet in there when they were growing up. I still have to be like A, B, C, D to get to N or find out. Acts uh, 26, 28. So not only is, is, um, is the word Christian, a true Christian, a reminder of Jesus Christ, but he is also a persuader. 26, 28 says this. And he's talking to King Agrippa. This is Paul here. He says, Agrippa said to Paul, are you going to persuade me to become a Christian so easily? Do you think that you can persuade me to become a Christian like you, Paul? Do you think that just because you're a sample, just, do you think that just because you, you live this whole thing out, do you think that you can persuade me to become like you, Paul? Christianity is a vocal relationship. We cannot become a Christian and then just hang out. You can't. Because, we, see, we are persuaders of the very one who changed us. And, and, and see, the Holy Spirit, He ignites this fire in you that you, if there's a truth within you, it's going to come out. I told this story one time. I tell it again for some of you, the, the benefit of so many people here. I was doing this, um, uh, I was doing this, uh, these, these, skills for whatever, for, uh, for the PR-24 for military police, and I'm training people, I'm like, all right, do this, and you put it in the arm, and then you, you, you just corkscrew upwards like this, and, and it'll torque them up, you get some pain compliance, and, and that's how you, you know, you put it, you apprehend them, and yada, yada, and as I'm doing this, I'm like, listen, I'm like, you just put that in there, and you just crank it up, you just crank it, just, just give it right up to Jesus, just, just give it right up to him, and, I, and after I said that, I'm like, what did I just say? <laughs> like, I shocked myself, I'm like, what am I doing? I'm like, the military, I'm like, trying to explain to people, but this analogy, I'm just give it right up to Jesus. Just give it up to Him. But there's it's, there's something there's something inside of you that when you know the truth, it just it just comes out. Because at that point, it's not you; it's the Holy Spirit living in you that that just like burns. As Jeremiah said, he says, "I got a fire shut up in my bones that I just can't keep silent." Praise God! I'm telling you, Lord, do that in me. Do not shut. Do not allow my mouth to be shut. Beth would tell you, it's never shut, Jeff. <laughs> but I'm sorry, I love you. But the, you see, the reality is like, is, 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 let's be real. 
And if there's a problem, let's let's talk about it. That's that's cool. Awesome. We got a problem? Sure. Hey, I'm struggling. Awesome. As Pastor Miriam told me when I first got here, she goes, Jeff, if you can't share your problems with the church, then please tell me who you can share them with. And it was an, it was an eye opener for me. And I'm like, you're so right. But this, this false concept of, 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 of us not being able to share our problems in the church has us, has us bound up because then we're like, well, I'll share my problems with people outside the church. And then you got followers of Job that are trying to just lead you away and you got Job's wife saying just, well, kick Jesus to the side because he never did anything for you. And I'm always here for you, but the church isn't. Well, that, well let's be open and real. Let's be honest. Praise God we've got a great church where we can be honest and real. And if you're not, well, ask the Holy Spirit to open you up. You see, we are a persuader. We persuade people. I got this little, um, I got this little coupon for a keychain. It's like a police law enforcement type keychain, if you will. But it's, it's literally, it's right on, it says the persuader. All right? And so I carry this thing around. And I play with the kids. It's on our, our shed key. And, uh, and we're going around. And I'm like, hey, I'm like, I'm like you want to see this thing? And he's like, oh, sure. And so it's literally, it's like, it's this long, but if you put it on the right places on the bone and hold the wrist in a certain loving way, um, it will persuade the person to do what you want them to do. It will, all, it, it will persuade them, be, whether it's campaign compliance or whether it's something else, it will persuade them. If I want them to go this way, then I'll just turn that persuader. But it persuades you. And see, our life circumstances do what? It persuades us. If we have the love of God and we know something is real, it's, it's funny. People um, often say, Jeff, do you have stock in, in this or in Apple or in that Bible that you just got? Or do you have, do you like, are you going to get something from selling this thing? But it's like, when I'm excited about something, and I know we all have different personalities, all right? And I'm going to pick on Melody. My, my personality is totally different melodies. But we went to a, uh, we went to a, a, the mini, the mini car, what is it, the go-kart place, right? Yeah. Years ago. All right, I was laughing, and because we're in this place, and Melly's like, I'm not going to ride in those go-karts, so she just sits down, and the kids go on there, and uh, this other lady sits down next to Melody, and, I'm like, and I see them, I walk by, and I see them talking, you know, Melody's personality, and, and they're just talking, and I hear, them, I hear her start talking about the Lord, this, per, this persuader, this little representative of Jesus Christ, and, I, and we get in line, I'm like, I tell Beth, I'm like, that lady sat down the wrong lady. <laughs> <laughs> she's going to hear about the Lord right now. Yeah. Because there's a persuasion that's like, I want you to know. I want you to know the truth, not so I could just save you from something, but so that you can have life. Because God says, I want you to have life, and I want you to have it abundantly. It's not just this like legalistic plane you get on, and you're like, Sunday church, week long, I'm a Christian. <laughs> But it's like, and we, we duck into the landing port at the church just to, to get our fill up of, of death and then come right back out into the week of nothingness. It's like, no. There should be a daily, there should be a constant fill up that when I'm flying at 30,000 feet, man, I'm calling in this refueler to fly, to fill me up midway. I'm putting on Christian music. I'm getting the word. I'm going to turn on the word. I, I want to be filled, Lord God. Fill me to overflowing so I can, I can be a representative. I can be a sample of who you are, Jesus. But not only that, I can be a persuader and persuade someone and say, look, I, you do whatever you want. I, it's, you're, it's not my life, folks. But if I, I was talking to some guy out here last night at uh, 11 o'clock at night. Having a bad, whatever he was doing, right? And so we're talking and um, got to pray for him. And I'm saying, I'm like, in my mind, all I want to do is tell him about Jesus. I don't care about all this other stuff. My, my, all I want to do is I want to be friends with you so I can share, you, share the love of Christ with you. Because I know that's eternal. Our friendship, although I love it, is temporal. And I want eternity. I want you. I want people. I want, I want God. God created his people. And I want to go after those people to persuade them and say, look, a life that you have right now, is, 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 you may think it's okay, but it's subpar. In Jesus Christ. You're going to take off and you're going to be not in a Boeing 787. You're going to be in a fighter jet that's going 100 miles an hour doing things you never thought could happen. And not because it's just fun. It's because there's life. And there truly is liberty. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And that freedom pulls you from fear, from depression, from anxiety, from being locked in 
to your room not wanting to leave from just destruction. This is like like crazy thought process all the time. Do you see that like that fear? So I had PTSD coming back from Iraq. I had nightmares so much so that I wake up in the middle of the night and I would hold Beth down in the bed and I would kick her and punch her in the middle of the night because it was, I was having dreams and I was fighting in my dreams. And so much so, she, she'd be like, I, I'm not going to sleep in bed with you anymore if, if you're going to do this. Rightfully so. And I, I couldn't control it. It was just, it was, I would have nightmares. But do you understand that the love of God supersedes all of that stuff? And that, that has not happened in years. Why? Because I went to some count. No. Because Jesus Christ renews us and changes our minds, our thinking. He has the power and ability. If he can go and speak life into Pharaoh when he's sleeping, then doggone it, he can come into my mind and begin to quell certain things that this world has placed upon my mind. And he can destroy those things and create things new. That is the power of God. And because of that, I then want to go to veterans and persuade them and be like, no, you don't have to live like this. You don't have to be pent up in this anxiety. You don't. You, if you surrender, if you surrender to Jesus Christ, do you understand the possibilities of living in freedom? If there, there's power in His name. They're, they're tr- it's not just a song. It's not just words. It's, it's the truth. And this truth, it, it sets us free, folks. And it causes you to be an example and persuade I could sit here and talk for hours on this, but I don't have time. Um, it's, it's amazing. We, he not only reminds us, he persuades us. Go to 1 Peter 4.16, please. This is the third location. Keep on going, going to the end. It's, uh, it's going to be um, 1 Peter, 1 Peter. First Peter, after Hebrews, after James, there you go, First Peter. It's 19, page 1976 in my Bible, if anyone was wondering. First Peter 4. So as you, put, as you get here, First Peter 4, 16. First Peter 4, 16, it says this. If I can get there, that's one. First Peter 4. 16. And he says, But if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in having that name. Ready? But if anyone suffers as a what? Christian, let him not be excuse me, ashamed, but let him glorify God in having that name. I'm telling you folks, it's not, Christianity is not just a reminder. It's not just a persuader. But you see that it Christian, that word Christian, it should be a, a, a conscience for people in a gray world that is afraid of calling things black and white. It, is, it should be a conscience in, in, in this world, this, with this Christian. We should be, have the ability to, to stand tall and speak the truth of God. To say, no, this is what the Word of God says. I don't care what the world or the political agenda says. This my friends, is what Jesus Christ says. God created us male and female. And he created marriage between a male and a a, a woman. This is what the Word of God says. And I can stand unashamedly and say, don't be mad at me. That's what God said. We live in a world that is afraid of calling black white. We ought to be a Christian prior to being white. We ought to be a Christian prior to being black. We ought to be a Christian prior to being Hispanic. We ought to be a Christian prior to being Puerto Rican or or Brazilian or Asian or whatever or Democratic. We ought, our representation is of Christ, not our skin, not our nationality. We are Christians. And this whole, this whole craziness of, well, you got to have a white church and a black church and a Hispanic. No. God created us all, folks. We are one under Christ. Amen. And we worship together, and I'm going to praise God together, and we're going to fight hell together. Amen. And we're going to worship God, and we're going to put out fires in hell, and we're going to bring all people that God created together. 
Because it's, it's, it's Jesus Christ, folks. It's, it is not, it's, the, oh, we ought to be a people. I've never seen anything in here that differentiated anyone. The only time Jesus Christ differentiates are the ones who do not follow him and the ones who do. The ones who sin and the ones who said, God, I can't stop sinning, so change my life. And he changed our life. And then he says, now I call you Christian. My son, my daughter. You see that, that when, when the Christianity should be a reminder of who Jesus Christ is. Christianity, we should persuade people. A real Christian should, should be on fire to persuade men and women and children of who he is. And, and Christianity should be a conscience for a lost and broken world. To stand and say, look, I know this is not going to be politically correct when I say this. But I want to tell you the truth. And, and that is what we ought to be. And it's not our own mind. It's the Word of God that says it. You see, that, that truth that God has established, it should stand firm. And, the, and there are two voices. There's man's and there's God's. And man's is always going to be wrong. There's two voices in this world. There's man's. There's a Supreme Court justice. There's lots of political realms all across the world. And there's God's. Man's, always going to be wrong. God's, always going to be truthful. And it is always right. It will never change. It never has. It never will. God is always the same. And it's Jesus Christ that has, that has died and rose again. And this, this Christianity, it's, 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 we, we, we have to listen to God. We have to listen to what He says. And then say, thus says the Lord, this is what He says. And if you don't like it, don't be mad at me. I'm just telling you what he said. That's okay. And this is why he says, but if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be what? Sad. Saddened, ashamed? Yep. Because why? Let him glorify God in having that. When we tell the truth, do you want to... I... So, my son, they're playing... I, this is really funny. This is a different story. So we're, we're in Bolton, and these kids, uh, uh, Keenan and Zevi, are in the bathtub, and I hear something going on in the commotion. Beth and I are in the living room, and I hear, I hear, uh, Holy Ghost and fire. Holy Ghost and fire. And I'm like, what is going on back there? And Keenan and Zevi were really little. They're in the bathtub, and they're baptizing each other in the bath. He says, I baptize you in the Holy Ghost and fire. And they take turns, and they do it. And I'm just like, I'm like, yeah. yeah. My kids are baptizing each other. And I'm just like, but it, you, do you understand? Like, how, it like makes you proud. Yeah. You're just like, that's right. Take that, devil. They don't really go to church. They get baptized in a bathtub. And it's just like, but there's a reality that you're just like, you're like, man. When, it, when, it, when your child does something, you're just like, and, and, and they, they glorify God. And, you're just like, wow. You're wowed by it and you're, you're proud. You don't even say anything to them. You just walk away and it's like, yeah, that's, my, that's, that's mine. <laughs> Do you understand that when we stand and all men criticize us, the world comes and says, you're wrong. You're not inclusive. You're not, you are, oh, this, that's, oh that's, that's, let's not talk about that or this or that. It's like, no. God loves you the same. All sin is the same under Christ. Whether it's drinking, whether it's smoking it up, whether it's homosexuality, whether it's orgies, whether, whatever it is, it's all the same. It's all the same under God. But in 1 Corinthians it says, I have given you power to overcome all these things. And so we look at all these things the same that the answer is Jesus Christ. And so we don't differentiate as one above the other, but we say, hey God, I, I, your word says it, so here it is. And the reason why he says it is because he wants to make us a persuader. He wants to give us the ability to speak truth. He wants us to be a conscience to a lost world. Do you understand that we folks are the only Bibles anyone will ever read? Do you understand that? We are. We are the only representation of Jesus Christ anyone, people will ever read. And if that representation is wrong then we have the tendency to push them away and it's on God. Ezekiel says this. He says, if you speak to someone and tell them the truth, the blood, I remember I reading this, I was like, man, I, I got to keep open my mouth now. 
He said this. He said, I've called you to be a watchman. And he says, speak to people. And if you speak to them and tell them the truth, you can take your hands off. Because if they die in their sin, the blood's on them. He says, but if you speak to them and tell them the truth, you can still take your hands off. And if they turn, you have one one for the kingdom of God. But it's Jesus Christ who does that work. It's the Holy Spirit that does the work. We just are the persuader that leads them. We are just the ones who say, go to Jesus. We are the sample to say the real thing, it's over there. We don't lead them to any church. I mean, we lead them here, whatever. They don't want to come here, that's fine. I'm leading them to Jesus Christ. I'm not here to lead them to a church. I'm here to lead them to Jesus. And when we, when we begin to look at that, that is how God just, he begins to transform us. And, and, and he, 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 he says, he, he just says, you, you are my son, you are, you are good and faithful, and now let's do this. Let's do this thing. Let's be a real Christian. Let's be that real thing. Let's be that persuader. Let's be the one who is a representation. And let's be, folks, church of Jesus Christ, let, let's be the conscience to a world that is lost. But as St. Francis Sisi said, preach the gospel as often and wherever you possibly can. And when necessary, use words. Do you understand? It is our life representation. It's our actions that our children are looking at us and saying, Christian? Really? Really? But just because that may, be, may have been the way in the past doesn't mean that that can't change now. Because Christ can reveal things and thank God children are so forgiving. You see that we have the ability to change these things. And is Alex in here? No? We look at this thing and it's like, it's awesome because everyone's heard this, this scripture in Psalm 23, right? Yes, Psalm 23? Psalm 23, what does it say? Where's my Bible scholars at? Yep, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want... He leads me beside what? Still waters. waters and restores my soul. Thy rod and thy staff, or his rod and his staff. You understand these words? I'm going to close with this. Uh, these, these words, the rod and staff, are one and the same. It's just on how he uses them. And when, when he leads us beside these still waters, I mentioned earlier this morning that, um, that, that he... he uh, he, he restores our soul, but he, he, he corrects us, he, he moves us, he, he changes us, and, and, but we have the innate ability as sheep of the flock to eat ourselves into danger. We've got our heads down, and I was, it was funny, two days ago I was driving home and I, I drove past this field, and there was this tall grass, and these sheep are in there, and I was thinking about this, and, and these sheep are just eating their way across the field, not looking up. I'm like, man, I'm like, that's, that's been me in my life. I'm just like, <laughs> going through life, just taking everything in, right? Take life circumstances in. Take a good time in. We take a, 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 you know, a family issue in. We take that. And then something happens at work, we take that. And we, we're just taking all this stuff, eating, eating, boom. Eating information, eating worldviews, eating news, eating, eating scripture maybe Sunday morning for five minutes, and, and eating this and eating this. And we're just going through eating. And we're, we're eating our way into oblivion. But Jesus Christ... You can play if you want. But Jesus Christ, he, he comes to us and he, whether it's a rod or whether it is a, um, this, this staff, that he, he, he guides us in. Come here, Mike. I'm going to use it for a demonstration for a second. And, and as, as, no, I'm not going to tell you that. And as, as, it's pretty strong here. And so as, as we're walking, he, he walks forward and his, his head is down. And, and if God wants us to, he has a path for us. And he comes by with his word and a gentle correction. And this staff, he, he just, he guides us, right? Because his word comes. But sometimes we're, we're going so far and we're going and we're going and we're going. And he's trying to correct us, but we're so stubborn. We're still bleeding into it. And we're like, he's like, no, 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 go that way. And he's like, no, leading into it, leading into it. And we get ourselves stuck in a thicket. And we get our stuff stuck in this stress. Let me stay there. And this anxiety. And all this, we, we get ourselves stuck. And we're at home and we're like, man, my life's horrible. Everything's, I can't find a job. Everything's going down. And God, all the while, God knows the reality of it. And he says, open your word. And when he opens, the, when we open the word, 
he takes the staff and he pulls and sometimes it's painful because he's got to yank us out and he pulls us out of that thicket and yes there's scratches there's bruises we got it that happens but do you understand he pulls us out so he can restore us and set us back on the path of where he wants thank you but that's what I want to ask you guys because you, we all have been in a situation where there's hypocrisy where we have seen stuff that's not real or maybe ourselves are in a position where we, we're just like, eh, cool, I got it. I'm at church. Good job, preacher. But the reality is we don't all believe in ourselves. And we don't fully get to the point where we, we don't, I don't know if we sometimes believe that we truly can have freedom because maybe we've been walking this way for 30, 40, 50 years. And we get to the point where it's like, yeah, cool, got it, but 50, 50 years, Lord, you never taken me out of this. But God says, yeah, <laughs> how about now? And we allow him to because it's a free will decision. And so I just, I want to pray. I want to pray, um, just, I want to pray today and, and, and say, God's a good father. And he would never steer us in a wrong direction. Maybe our earthly fathers have not been the best. I have not been the best in my life to my kids. But God has changed things. And he can change us to be the, the, the representation, the, 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 the one who, who persuades, the one, the one who is a conscience to our family, who, who speaks the truth and says, this is what God says, folks. And I know the world may push you this way, but I'm telling you, that's not what God says. Haven't you seen what's happened in your life, how things have gotten crazy? But in Christ, there's freedom. So I want to pray. And if you, if you want to come up, I want to pray for you guys. And we are going to stand together in the knowledge. We can all stand together right now. And we can stand together in the knowledge that, that Jesus Christ is truly Lord. Whether people say it or whether they don't say it, doesn't change the fact that he's God. And doesn't change the fact that he heals. Doesn't change the fact that he can take us and move us and change us. It doesn't change the fact that he's still Jesus. So as we pray, I just want to pray together. Father, we, Lord, we thank you, Jesus. God, we, we give you praise, Father. Lord, you are worthy. We glorify you, Lord God. And I'm asking Jesus right now, Father, that you would restore us, Lord God. <coughs> Heavenly Father, that you would make us like Jeremiah, one who has fire shut up in our bones and wants to just speak your name, God. Father, one who, that, that you would change us, persuade us, make us like Isaiah, where, where we, we say, God, send me and let that coal cleanse my lips and, and make me appear before you. That we would listen to you when you, when you say, hey.